don't have a lot of time, so let's dive right into it. Uh, let's start with Karina, Karina Bayer from IMAX. Uh, IMAX Group, uh, of course, has two great uh, trade shows, uh, two big trade shows. And of course, with the pandemic, it, everything changed uh, this year, of course. Um, what was your experience of trying to get some of the experience of the uh, offline uh, event to, 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 to people who were counting on your event this year? Yeah, so our shows are um, really represent the global business events industry. So our exhibitors are countries, cities, destinations, convention centers, hotel groups, etc. And our buyers are really people um, like Web Summit and other organizers who are planning uh, major globally rotating events of, of all types. Um, what we did this year, usually we would have shows in Frankfurt and Las Vegas with about 15,000 people at each from 100 countries. So what we did this year was um, convert to a new online brand called Planet IMAX, where we really try to take certain elements and not all elements of the offline uh, in-person event, but certain elements that we felt that we could present well online to really drive, um, continue to drive the connections within our industry, the community within our industry and the inspiration and knowledge as well. And that was really our main focus for this year. Uh, with the online events that we put on. Uh, that's that's uh, probably a great challenge that you have to come up with uh, in short notice, of course. Um, to uh, I'll get back to you. Let's go now to Douglas, Douglas Emsley. Uh, the Society of Independent Show Organizers, of course, has a lot of members. Um, and you, you got the experience of so many events uh, in this area. Uh, what, the, what were your experience in throughout this uh, 2020 pandemic uh, in terms of the, the main events that you uh, watched out? Yeah, well, I, uh, for my day job, I'm CEO of Tarsus, uh, and course, it runs yeah. 180 events around the world. About 45% of our business is in the US and 25% in China and about 20 in the Middle East. Um, I'm also chairman of SISO, which is the association uh, for for-profit exhibition organizers mm -hmm. in America, although 70% of the members are American and 30% are international. I mean, what we've seen in our own business is interesting in that in China, um, we started being operational in July. So we've run 10 shows, uh, live shows uh, over this period. Uh, whereas I, if I go to America, uh, America stopped. Uh, we've now run in the last uh, three weeks, two live events in, in, in Florida. So we're beginning to see America open up, but the, the markets are behaving totally differently. If I look at China, mm -hmm. it's come back and it looks very much like exhibitions looked like last year, about 80% of the exhibitors have come back and they are doing business and to be honest no one is talking about virtual events or hybrid events oh if i go to america it, it's it's the opposite very few events have run and people have been looking at pivoting which is a terrible word which i hate into digital <laughs> um and and to date it 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 is different by sector uh, i mean we run big events in the medical sector in america and there we're seeing uh, a sector that's migrated very, very quickly online in terms of education and in terms of how particularly pharmaceutical companies are using their budget to reach their audience. So it's very much oh. embracing uh, the digital world, but it very much varies by sector. And for the SISO membership, it, it's varied as well. I think that a lot of people have just scrambled to actually take the live experience and try to replicate it uh, online. And to be blunt, all of the feedback is that that has not actually proved to be successful for our customers. Mm -hmm. The return of investment hasn't been there. So people are now beginning to actually work through better models that actually give return to our customers. That, that's interesting. I'll get back to you also. Uh, let's go to Johan. 
from uh, GWC. Uh, you, 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 of course, uh, ma your main business is planning uh, for venues and trade fairs and helping uh, companies to with the logistics. Of course, uh, in this pandemic, your work were, was completely changed, uh, right? What uh, are you preparing for a, a, a probably different future of events now? And how are you preparing for it? I wouldn't say our, our work has completely changed. I mean, the, uh, we're a consulting company for the trade fair and conference industry now, and, uh, and we work basically all over the world. So what has really changed is the, the fact that we uh, not always <coughs> can, can see our, our clients physically, which of course is in a, in a way a burden. Yeah? But, uh, but on the other hand, with the new technology and so on, I think it, it worked quite well. So all in all, I would say we, we are very happy with, uh, with the year 2020. 2021, there will be, will be a little bit of more of uncertainty. So when it comes to <coughs> the, the issues um, uh, Doug was just talking about, I think this is one uh, of the main areas we are active right now, where we see basically that the entire industry right now is focusing on the one hand on health and safety, and on the other hand, uh, basically on virtual events. Now those virtual events, in, not in all cases, but in very, very many cases, we see that those virtual events are, I call them a one time off. So they mm. are created and, and then basically after they have taken place, it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the biggest problems our industry has is that we need a holistic strategy, meaning that we have to integrate the physical and the virtual part. Hmm. And sometimes when we talk to our clients, they say to us, look, I mean, the virtual event, um, well, we must be able to monetize the virtual event. And we always say, this is nonsense. Uh, hmm. The only purpose of a virtual event, however you call that, must be to strengthen the face-to-face -face event. And that's what we're working on. We're working on with a lot of clients to say, okay, how can we position them or how can they position themselves to create basically an environment where virtual and physical are going hand in hand, but whatever they do is strengthening the face-to-face -face part. Because mm -hmm. if we don't achieve that, we will not be able as an industry to compete on the virtual side only. So course, we yeah. work on that with organizers and the interesting part also with a lot of venues. Yeah, because mm. venues, they need to be integral part of whatever becomes virtual. And that's a very interesting proposition because I think uh, that's, let's say, a perspective which is very often overseen in the industry that venues need to prepare themselves to be part of the all virtual, let's say, livelihood we will have in the future more tv show uh perspective probably for the tv I mean, audience let's yes, say like that and that so so the the big problem i see basically that we have so many stakeholders doing mm -hmm. so many different things you see you have the organizers they have ideas how to become virtual you have the venues they have their own ideas but then you have a lot of service providers also of course have their own ideas at the end of the day all those need to, we always say, have one face to the customer. And the problem is they don't, you see? I mean, there is an organizer who has a face to the customer, there is a venue who has a face to the mm. customer, and there are a lot of service providers who also have a of face course. to the customer. And that, that, that creates basically, when you then look mm. at face to face versus virtual, that creates a lot of complexities. And this is what we're working on, both with organizers and venues and sometimes also, also service providers. Let's go to Karina, especially to see uh, this, uh, what do you think about this hybrid model, this uh, uh, venues trying to adapt? Uh, uh, are you looking at it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from the venue side, those are our clients, of course, and I think it's their competitive advantage. They have to work out how they can partner with the organisers to put themselves in a position of having a piece of the puzzle of the hybrid experience. Um, I think as an organiser, as, as Doug and as, as Joachim said, you know, 
it's um, the business model is something we're still working out in terms of how virtual um, will fit with the live. Um, actually, I think we just need to have a digital mindset and really change our mindset as organisers, because what people want to experience and what we can deliver in the digital world is not the same as the live world. And so we really need to work out what your event is, what the purpose of it is, and therefore what fits in the digital world and what doesn't. And that will be different for different events and different industries. Um, and the one element that we haven't really worked out as an industry is the true connection, networking and business. Because trade show organisers exist to deliver business opportunities to our clients. And, and that hasn't been proven in the digital world yet. There may be solutions, but I don't believe it's going to be a cookie cutter solution of taking your trade show 3D model into a digital environment and just expecting the same thing to happen. So we need to work out what business means in the digital world if we're truly going to inhabit that space during the year. But you think a virtual has a place now after this pandemic? Uh, yeah, I think the the uh, the pixie's out of the bag. You know, you can't put it back in Pandora's box. Um, so digital does have a place, but but I think we have to think about it differently. I don't think that you're going to get trade shows that have an exact presence online at the same time as the trade yeah. shows happening in person, which is something people talked about. I think, as Doug said a lot of clients have been disappointed by the trade show experience online during this year so i think we still need to work out what that digital experience is going to be for our clients on a year-round basis that complement our live in-person uh, events and trade shows but the pinnacle experience is still live that doesn't mean there's no experience that we can deliver online but but the pinnacle is always going to be live we're sure on time. So uh, Web Summit is online. We are talking online. People have mingle, have networking uh, things to process. Uh, I've been to Collision, so I know how it works. Uh, what do you think are the best examples that you want to use uh, specifically in the future? And let's start with uh, Doug. Well, I, I think that Collision uh, was a very good example of trying to do something that, that's different. And I, and I think one of the challenges, and Corinna really hit the nail on the head, is that we need to invent new content, new ways of doing business for this media. And where the face-to-face -face really works is about networking, it's about commerce. And that's been very, very, very difficult to create virtually. So I, I think we've got to look at this differently. And I think where we are at the moment is on the invention of television, the BBC went to the Albert Hall to film what was going on there. We have got to create our own content for the digital channel and not just try and take what exists today and put it digitally. And we are in the foothills. We, we were nowhere near climbing the mountain. Of course, Johan, your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I, I think, uh both Karina and, and, and Doug have made good points here. Uh, I think what, what has happened basically, uh, let's be honest, over the past, I would say, two to three decades, our industry has been, I would say, has been very fat. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was no, we had some crisis, but everything was running ex extremely well. Revenues were going up. Profits were amazing. Yeah, profit margins in our industry was, were perfect. So, it's natural that the drive for innovation is low. Yeah. Mm. And now all of a sudden we see the crisis and we say, wow, I mean, we, we must do something. Now, your question though is, is correct. I mean, who has invented the right model? And to be frank, I don't see anybody. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that I say, I mean, I, I would have the idea, but uh, in, our, in our company, we have mm. always, and this is really true since more than 10 years advocating one idea and we said, uh, the, co the company which will be successful in the future will have to provide communication and matchmaking services independent of medium, time, and location. Of course, yeah. Uh, we have to go to Karina because our time is uh, yeah. wrapping up. Sorry, Johan. 
Well, Karina, can you add up? It's short on time, so just to say, I totally agree with what's been said, and I think it is about rethinking the, the model, not breaking everything that we've already got. We've got successful live events, which will come back because of the human need and desire to meet and do business together. Um, but I think there's a great opportunity, actually, for the industry to innovate and, and to try out an extent with what it means to provide provide commerce in a digital space that can really complement and drive that face-to-face -face experience. So that's our opportunity. Of course, and Web Summit does 10 years in a remote way. So it's good. People will see that. Absolutely. So thank you so much, everybody. We have to wrap up. This, we are, we are, I'm in Lisbon. You are at your homes. That's back to you, Web Summit.